coming up on Garden Talk. With the more experience, you kind of see how your plant tries to get away from the light. Like, you can see the light stress with proper experience, is what I'm trying to say. Go about 300 for seedling, between 3 and 600 in veg, and between 6 and like 900 in flower. They saved my butt a couple times, telling me about a power outage. It's not just at home where you'll get notifications, you could be absolutely anywhere. Mainlining is one of my most favorite ways to grow. I just enjoy getting all that energy to the top of the plants. Do your tucking until the end of week one. Now that could change, obviously. If you're going with like a more sativa strain, I would probably tuck until like uh, maybe the end of week two. Like I have no one to impress, either do you. You have no one to impress. Just grow your herb and have fun doing it. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This is episode number 52. In this episode, I interview Rose of Green. He has been gardening for 20 years and grows plants such as carrots, tomatoes, cucumbers, and medicinal varieties. In this episode, we get into lighting, environment, and plant training. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Mr. Grow It. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Big shout out to Dutch Pro for sponsoring this podcast. Dutch Pro is a plant fertilizer company that has been around for over 30 years. They have base nutrients and they also have additives such as PK boosters, root stimulators, CalMag, silica, a nutrient optimizer, and a foiler feed. They also have pH regulators to help ensure that the nutrients can be uptaken properly. I will leave a link to Dutch Pro's Amazon store down in the description section below, and you can use coupon code MrGrow10DP for a discount on their products. A big supporter of this podcast is AC Infinity. They sponsor this podcast, and I use their products. AC Infinity now has gardening tools and accessories, such as heavy duty fabric grow pots, trimmers, grow room glasses drying racks, plant ties, and trellis nets. They also have all of the equipment needed for a ventilation system. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. Spider Farmer is a sponsor of the podcast. Coupon code MrGrowIt5 will get you a discount on their products. They're most known for their LED grow lights, but they also have other products such as grow tents, inline fans, and carbon filters. I've used their SF1000, SF2000, and SF4000 LED grow lights in the past, and I got some great results with them. I will leave a link to Spider Farmer's Amazon store down in the description section below. And don't forget to use coupon code MrGrowIt5 for a discount on their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Rose of Green. How are you doing today? Good, good. How are you doing? Doing good? Good. Thanks for asking. Today we're going to get into a whole bunch of things. Lighting, we're going to get into environment, and plant training, which a lot of people say that those three things are some of the main keys to success in your garden, right? So lots of things to talk about there. First though, let's do an introduction. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening? Yeah, so I'm from a small town, northern Ontario, Canada, and uh, I've been gardening since I was like uh, five, six years old. Uh, my grandmother had a real huge area, a real huge garden where she uh, grew like flowers and uh, plants and stuff, uh, which she would make like bouquets and stuff and then uh, sell them to like people who were having weddings and funerals and just things like that. So uh, pretty much since I was just a little one, I've been in the garden uh, growing something. So, And now you've gotten up to the point where you have a YouTube channel now and you're sharing your garden with the world on the internet, you actually have almost 40,000 people following you, right? 40,000 subscribers on YouTube alone. I'm not sure what your Instagram numbers are or any of your other social media, but you've got quite a big following there. And looking through your videos, I actually have your channel open right now on the side here. You're showing your garden all the way through all the different growth cycles from seedling, 
veg, flour, harvest dry cure, all that stuff you're covering there. You even do like Q&A videos and all that stuff. So I'll definitely be sure to link that down in the description section below for those of you tuning on YouTube so you can visit his channel and see what he's got and subscribe to him. Also, if you are on one of the podcast platforms, just search his name, Rosa Green. He'll come up. Uh, let's start with lighting. What grow lights are you currently using? I use uh, the Mar- Mars Hydro FC 6500 is uh, one of my main lights. And then I use uh, a couple of the SP 3000s. And then I just put in an FC 8000 uh, into one of my 4x4s. Uh, I know I'll get a little pushback with that. People think it's overkill for me to be running a 8000 watt light in a 4x4. But I just run it dimmed at like 50-60%. Uh, just because I have that much power uh in the tent it doesn't mean that i'm using it all so uh th- that's that's basically what i'm using do you say 8000 watts or sorry 800 watt it's all right F- F- 8000 yeah that is an overkill <laughs> yeah, yeah, burning down the house <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's yeah. enough that's enough watts for multiple rooms in your house right, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah i'm running the manufacturer facility there yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Mars Hydro, they have some good lights, for sure. They yeah, definitely come, have some good lights. Yeah, uh, they've come a real long way. Like, uh, honestly, a few years ago, I probably wouldn't have touched them. But uh, over the years, they're really, you can see they're really starting to pick things up. They're uh, they're making good quality lighting and fairly cheap for, like, people getting into it and stuff. I find, anyway. And uh, honestly, uh, I found their customer service to get a little bit better. Uh, I am sponsored by them, so obviously I'm going to get top-of-the-line customer service. But uh, my subscribers, I noticed, are not complaining to me about their customer service so much anymore. It's like they stepped their level up a little bit. And I'm actually like, before, I I wouldn't be proud to say I was working with Mars Hydro, and today I could actually say I am. Uh, I am proud to be working with them. Like, See, I remember their blurples back in the day, I mean, 2014, 2015, and they were selling those lights all the way up until, like, 2019. It's like, I think they still are, them. aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if they are, but, yeah. No, I, I think they took them down. I think they the are. The Reflector them. series, eh? Yeah, yeah. I've given them that feedback. I'm like, why are you selling all day lights? They're like, well, they sell. I was like, oh. Yeah. Come I on. noticed uh, <laughs> that uh, Viper Spectra company is still selling those on Amazon, uh, the purple ones. Are they? Really? Yeah, yeah. They actually have a new light, though, which I'm actually getting my hands on it. They're sending me over one. It's a bar-style light, and I was impressed with the specs. I think, actually, by the time this episode is released, I don't think they're going to have the light released, so I'm not going to talk too deep into it. But okay. they're another company that's come a, a long way in regards to the fixture, like the quality-wise build of the fixture. Good stuff these days, for sure. Yeah, I've always liked that company. They do have quality stuff. Like their quantum boards are all uh, quality. You can tell that they take care of their stuff. And uh, that new light you're talking about, yeah, people are going to be impressed with that. I got the the download details on that thing uh, a couple months ago, and it does sound like it's going to be a pretty good light. That, and they do have others coming on the way, too that I won't really speak of. <laughs> yeah. I'm running the, so I have three grow lights right now. I have a, a four by four tent where I'm running two lights. I'm running the ES 300 V3 by the green sunshine company on one side. And then the SF 2000 led grow light by spider farmer on the other side. I personally grow, you know, all different cultivars within the tent. And so for me, I per- personally like to run two lights in there so I can have different light distances as needed as some grow taller than the other. So that's what I'm currently running. And then I have a two by four tent, which has a ES 180 V3 by the Green Sunshine Company. And all those lights I've really gotten some good results off of. But you have to run them dimmed, right? There's the, 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 these grow lights these days, a lot of them are more powerful than needed. You know, and and the problem is there's a lot of new growers. They want to run them at max. They think they're they're helping their plants more when they're running them on full power. When in in reality, a lot of these new lights, you can dim them down and you actually run them dimmed for the entire grow, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, that's... uh... That's what I, uh, I I tell people. Like, when people question me on the show or on my videos, sorry, uh, they say, well, what should I run my light at? And... I will answer them. Well, first I need to know like what kind of light you have uh, because they're all so different nowadays from the quantum style to the bar lights. Uh, Like you might have to run a different wattage, but not only that is they're so efficient nowadays that you, 
I don't even know how you would go by gram per watt or anything anymore or go by by per watt because they're just so efficient you're either cranking them up or or, or you don't need to crank them up it's either one way or the other so uh, when people ask me uh, how do I run my light it's like check the check the manufacturer what they recommend or uh, do a quick Google search to see uh, see if you could find your answer there or you could just watch your plants all together like we used to do uh, back in the day before parameters and stuff and uh, you just watch your plant for like uh, your tips turning down the talk wing uh, like the light stress how your plant is like trying to shrivel its way it's just trying to get away from that light uh, you could see it uh, with a little bit of uh, education or something the word that I'm trying to use uh, anyway you just see it the more you grow the more you'll see signs of it trying to get away from the light and stuff like that yeah it definitely comes down to experience i think is what you're trying yeah, to get experience at. there we are <laughs> but i don't know why yeah. i can get that out but uh yeah with the more experience you kind of see how your light or how your plant tries to get away from the light like you can see the light stress with proper experience is what i'm trying to say yeah so the, the light energy coming down is, is photons, you know, a lot of people refer to it as a, kind of like picture it as balls of energy coming down like rain onto your plant, right? And you, you increase the amount of density, you're increasing the amount of, of rain or photons that's coming down onto the plant. Now, people refer to that, you know, it's PAR, photosynthetically active radiation. Are you aiming for a specific amount of PAR or DLI? Yeah, uh, DLI, I... I truly, I typically try to run around uh, 40 DLI at all times. But uh, when I'm again, when I'm trying to explain it to new growers and stuff, I'll I'll be a little more uh, lenient with my words, and I'll tell them like, go about 300 for uh, seedling, between three and 600 in veg, and uh, between six and like 900 in flower. Um, I try to stay away from telling them, hey, crank it to uh, 1250 in flower because I don't want to see anybody burn their plants up. Honestly, if you're seeing like uh, deficiencies or, or, or something like that, chances are it's too much light. You're giving them so much light that they're trying to take up their nutrients more so then you're getting that burn. So, uh, yeah, I try to just be a little more lenient with uh, the PPFD levels that I tell people to use. But for myself, yeah, I, I'm around uh, a DLI of around 40. Sometimes I will push it depending on strain. Uh, ambient CO2 is usually around four or 500, but um, in my house, it's usually around 750. So uh, I'll be able to play around with my uh, PPFD a little bit. Sometimes I'll get it up to around 1200, uh, 1250. But uh, for the most part, I'm maxed out around 1050 in flower. I think those are some good general ranges that you mentioned before for for beginners or somebody yeah. who isn't quite aware of it because that'll that'll help you kind of kind of like in safe ranges I'd say exactly. Um, now a lot of folks they're not going to have the par meter in order to kind of measure it, right? You could you go and buy one of these par meters. Apogee has one. There's a spot on par meter. There's several different measurement tools now that you can use to measure the amount of par that that your light puts out, and then you can kind of adjust your light distance that way. If you don't have one of those and you don't want to spend the money on one of those, you could always, what I usually tell folks is, check out the PAR chart that the manufacturer puts on the grow light listing, right? So usually, you know, most companies, I think just about every company now, is putting a PAR chart on there. It's gonna be basically an overview snapshot of the different PAR numbers in PPFD that shows you at the different light distances. So you can kind of refer to that chart and then adjust your light distance that way. I think that's that's usually what I tell folks that are, are beginning. But yeah, those ranges you mentioned are, are pretty spot on in my opinion. I know you have the Pulse Pro. How do you like that? I do. I've actually, uh, I got four of them and uh, I like them quite a bit. I, uh, I'll be a little honest with you. I did start off using them for uh, VPD, but without having a sealed room, it's so difficult to keep that VPD day in, day out, uh, right head on uh hitting the nail on the head type deal it's hard to do without a sealed room so i just keep it as close as i can to the vpd and uh i go from there but uh they're a real cool unit like uh now you could actually get a, a somewhat basic ppfd reading with them uh, that's awesome you can see your spectrum uh most leds are going full spectrum nowadays anyway uh, but uh yeah i 
I really like them. They saved my butt a couple times telling me about a power outage. So uh, it's not just at home where you'll get notifications. You could be absolutely anywhere. I could be across the country or and or in a different country and still be able to get that reading. So uh, not to uh, totally try to advertise for them, but uh, they are a real awesome unit, uh, I find anyway. Yeah, I was curious about the Pulse Pro in particular because it does have uh, CO2 readings yeah. and also has the, the PAR meter on it built in, you know, so you can check what the PAR is and adjust your light distance according to that. Now, some people might get sticker shock once they see that the price is $500, right? Sure. You know, and I had sticker shock at first, but, you know, somebody commented on one of my videos and they're like, think about it though, right? You're getting a PAR meter within it. You know, that alone, the Apple G sells for like $525 alone. So you're getting a PAR meter, you're getting the CO2 measurements, obviously the temperature and humidity, and you're getting the, the ability to have it sent to your smartphone if something's out of range, right? So yep. you're getting those notifications when needed if things are out of range. I have the Pulse 1, need to get the Pulse Pro. I think I think that's my next one of my next purchases for sure. Yeah, they're pretty cool. And uh, yeah, you touch on the price of like a, a power meter. Well, that's the same thing for like a CO2 meter, a good CO2 meter, you're not finding under a hundred bucks for like a good one, you know? So, uh, yeah, yeah I th actually the price isn't bad if you actually think about everything that's in it. It would be nice to see them cheaper, but it is what it is, right? Yeah. So what temperature do you typically aim for? Uh, so in veg, I'll usually be around uh, 28 degrees Celsius. I think that's like 82, 83, maybe Fahrenheit. Uh, in veg, I'm usually around there. And then uh, as I get into flower, I like to cool things down a bit. Uh, I'll, I'll usually run around uh, 25 degrees during the day, uh, maybe 22 degrees at night. Uh, that's the same thing for veg. At night, I go down to about 24 degrees Celsius. So uh, when I talk, I'm talking at Celsius. Um, and yeah, anyway, I find in flower, uh, it's better off to go by like how true nature, uh, goes. It usually cools down in the fall. So, uh, not only that, I find it tightens up your buds and stuff. If you run it a little cooler in uh, flower, uh, I'm not sure if you noticed that, but it's just something that I picked up on over the years. And, uh, yeah, so I always try to run a little cooler in flower and, uh, warmer in veg. You bring up a really, really good point as far as the increased temperatures in veg and then reducing it in, in flour. What, so first off, I need to have a, uh, I need to learn Celsius because I'm, <laughs> I'm stuck in the, the freedom units as uh, as uh, pigeons often calls it. Yeah. Maybe if I have a key right here, I can see, okay, if he's talking this, this is that, you know what I mean? So I can quickly refer to it. Uh, I usually aim for, you know, around 80, 82 degrees Fahrenheit in the vegetation stage. And oftentimes I'm running that throughout flowering. Now, oh, yeah. I'm currently in school. A lot of people know that I'm in school for uh, cultivation. And one of the studies that was brought to my attention through this school is that they studied the optimal temperature. What is the optimal temperature? And they're doing pretty much what you're doing. They're seeing that high increased photosynthesis with the higher temps, you know, assuming that the VPD is dialed in, CO2 is dialed in, right? So they're going after the high photosynthesis during veg, a little bit into flower as well. However, towards the end of the flower, they're finding a, if you stay at that high temps, they're seeing that more airier bud structure, fox tailing can potentially occur, and also a loss of terpenes. They're evaporating. So their recommendation, what they found in the study, is that if you're lowering in those temps a little bit towards the end of flowering, maybe weeks five, six, and beyond, I'm just gradually lowering them, you can conserve some of those terpenes and it should result in more tighter uh, bud sites like you had mentioned that that you often see now of course that's going to depend on genetics and stuff like that but yeah. i thought it was worthy mentioning here because uh something i learned recently so now how about uh relative humidity what do you typically aim for there i uh in veg i try to shoot for 65 but uh it's hard to get that here in the winter even using like uh a humidifier so I always try to keep it around at least 50 to 65 in uh, veg. Sometimes I can't always get there, and it's somewhere around 45, and I just got the humidifiers pumped. But uh, for the most part, if it is around 55, I'm happy. And then in flower, I shoot for around 50%. So 50% uh, in flower just seems to – it's always worked for me. I've done it like that for a few years now, and uh, uh, it's what I prefer. 
Gotcha. So there are some general ranges that folks st stick by. You know, there's a lot of, you know, if you're a bare bones beginner just starting out and you just want to get through your grow, 40 to 60% is kind of the general range that the plant is going to grow. It's going to be fine. You're going to get a yield out of it, right? But dialing things in, which is kind of what we're talking about here, you know, VPD, you know, we, we, we talked about that a little while ago, right? So when your temperature changes, according to VPD, your humidity should kind of change as well, right? It should kind of uh, change with it. It really comes down to the stomata opening and being able to to intake that CO2 at a specific rate, right? So I personally do aim for uh, VPD. I find that I can actually naturally fall within that range just by the way my room is set up. So oftentimes when I'm running that 80, 82 degrees, I think VPD calls for, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, like 55 to 60 something, 62% or something like that. And of course, see the confusing thing is there's so many different VPD charts online. So if you were to search VPD chart, you would get so many different results. <laughs> I think a lot of people go after Pulse, their reference guides, but then there's different guides according to the difference in leaf surface temperature, which makes things even more confusing. So Generally speaking, usually it's like minus one degree on the leaf surface temperature. So what your canopy temperature is, for example, your leaf surface temperature is usually, you know, one degree less. Now lighting is going to turn in, is going to be an impact of that, right? If you're HID lighting, you're going to have the IR come down and heat up those leaves a little bit more than LED. So there is just so many variables when it comes to humidity, in my opinion, you know. But yeah, general ranges are certainly general ranges that folks can go by just to get to the grow, right? Yep. So do you supplement CO2 at all? Uh, no, I uh, I used to do like uh, the own, uh, I would make my own like milk jugs full of uh, uh, the sugar and yeast and try and do CO2 like that. And uh, honestly, that would work if I didn't use uh, an exhaust fan, if I was able to keep it cool enough uh, inside a tent with an air conditioner and not exhaust it out, it would work. But if you're running any sort of exhaust fan, even just into a, a, a lung room, it, it really doesn't help all that much. You really need to get that bottle hooked up if you want to take the advantage of CO2, I find. Uh, even with, um, I don't want to throw them under the bus or anything, but like the TNB Naturals, uh, I really don't find that works. It's basically the same thing that I made. If you're doing any exhausting at all, you're not going to get any benefits from that uh, whatsoever. I've tried it all. I've had a bunch of CO2 meters uh, that I purchased to try it all. Um, I wish I made more videos on it, to tell you the truth, uh, just so some people weren't wasting their money on things. Because um, as soon as that fan comes on, you're pretty much euchred. Uh, you lose that CO2. I agree. Yeah. I mean, if you're exhausting, you know, 24 seven, like some people have their inline fans on the entire time. I do use the TMB naturals. I do have the uh, canister for TMB naturals. I have a CO2 monitor as well, which I've taken measurements on. Uh, it's built up past a thousand at some points, oh, really? you know what I mean? But I wasn't exhausting 24 seven. I was doing intermittent exhausting, right? So I have the AC infinity inline fan, which is hooked up to controller and I have set points, you know, so if it goes over a certain temperature, it'll kick on, remove that hot air, and then it will turn off. And same thing with humidity. If humidity rises too high, reaches that set point, it'll turn off and then or turn on, exhaust, and then turn off when, when it's below that set point. So I feel like in that case, you can definitely get away with like the CO2 canisters and stuff. I also have the Exhale 365 bags. I just started using that last month. And things are working out pretty good so far with that. The whole thing got inoculated within a couple of weeks. <laughs> so I was a little bit surprised on that one. It's my first time using it. But I haven't done the CO2 measurements on that just yet. But I do know a lot of people that are running those with success. And they mentioned that they're they're increasing their CO2 levels quite a bit with the bags and also with the canisters. But yeah, I agree. If you're exhausting 24-7, mm, probably don't want to spend the money on CO2 since that's probably just being sucked out the, the grow space. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So exactly. If you got your fan off, why not, right? And uh, I haven't even tried out those mushroom bags yet, so uh, that might be something I try next, just to uh, give it a shot, see how it works. For sure, for sure. Now, what are you doing for like air circulation and air exchange? Oh, I'm uh, I'm hooked on AC Infinity, everything pretty much. So yeah, I uh, I got their new fans early. Uh, I don't think the other ones come out until like April or March or something. Um, 
they do have fans on their website now, but uh, that is just for uh, the non-oscillating ones. But uh, what I do mostly is I run uh, the AC Infinity fans or any other 6-inch fan I used to have. Uh, I'll typically have three in each 4x4 tent. Uh, I'll have one like on the floor, and then I'll have one on a close pole to me, and then one on a fire pole. Uh, I always like to tell people that uh, airflow is key. It's uh, I cannot uh, praise that enough. Uh, you want good airflow. You want air blowing around. And then I use, of course, uh, the six-inch exhaust fan uh, that I always change out my air and my tent. Uh, when it's on the off setting, it's really at about uh, two. Uh, the number two setting so it's always a bit of airflow and uh, it's usually up around eight percent uh, or setting number eight uh, exhausting during the day in order to keep that temperature down in flower or I could go to like the six setting in veg or something but uh, for the most part I use AC infinity uh, everything for uh, my indoor uh, indoor grow um, I can't even say they've really come a long way because they've always been uh, pretty much top-notch right like their fans it seems like everything that they put out is just uh they're hitting the nail on the head so yeah i completely agree they've definitely changed the game quite a bit uh, you know when it comes to their fans i mean that was that was a major game changer with it hooked up to the controller that yeah. you can have set points you know for temperature and humidity now they've got that oscillating fan that you mentioned i told them because i i work with them too I said, send me over four of them. <laughs> so I got four of them now nice. and I've been using those and my, I like to put at least two per grow tent in case one were to die out. Cause I've had that happen before where I had one of my inline fans die and I only had one in the tent at the time. So there was all that stagnant air and it led to bud rot and I had to throw away some colas that encountered bud rot, which was a freaking disaster. That's a, that's on my channel. People can, can watch that and, and laugh at me there, but um, <laughs> But yeah, AC Infinity, I, I do the same thing with trying to get airflow below the plants and also try to get airflow above the plants as well, kind of like through the canopy. I feel like it'll kind of work its way down below the plants, up through the canopy. And then, of course, if your inline fan inducting is connected to like the top part, well, then you're you're getting that exhaust there. And of course, having the rectangle intake vents open, like on your, if you're using a Guru tent, for example, is certainly key, right? Let's get into plant training next. Um, so what do you typically do for plant training? Do you do any like topping, LST, super cropping, anything like that? Yeah, I uh, I do a lot of mainlining. So I obviously I do a lot of topping and uh, bending and low stress training. So uh, mainlining is one of my most favorite ways to grow. Um, so so yeah, I I just enjoy getting all that energy to the top of the plants. And uh, just dealing with uh, big buds and colas instead of little popcorn buds and stuff. So uh, pretty much uh, any video you see of mine, I will have a mainline plant uh, either here or there uh, in one of my tents. But uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, basically I, I do it all. Uh, some, some super cropping I will do depending on uh, if I get a... a branch maybe too too long that I want to flatten out the canopy or something I might super crop or on my outdoor I will do some super cropping I actually super crop uh, a couple of them real hard uh, last spring and uh, just to make all the other tops come up so uh, I basically do it all when it comes to training can you explain the mainlining process in more detail for those that don't know what it is I mean from my understanding you're letting it grow to a certain node then you're topping, then you're letting those ones grow to a certain node, then you're topping again. Can you explain in detail like how you go about doing the mainlining process? Yeah, so uh, basically uh, it's what you just said. You let it grow up to like uh, maybe the fourth node. Um, you want your plant to be like eight inches tall, and then you take off like uh, four inches right away or something. You take it down to like the fourth node. You don't have to do it that way. You do lose a little bit of veg time that way, but uh, I really prefer to do that so that you get stronger branching. But uh, once you top it the first time, um, you top it, you spread those branches apart a little bit, and then you remove all the other bottom branches. So then you got your two mains coming out like that. Uh, so then your next time you top these two mains, so you do uh, two toppings, you top one on your right, one on your left, and then, uh, so then you got your four tops and four mains coming off that with everything else below removed. So, uh, 
uh, then you would top your third time. So then you get eight tops. So every time you top, you're pretty much doubling your tops, the amount of tops you have. Uh, I typically stop around eight. Uh, I am going to be doing one on this next series. I'm going to be doing one plant to uh, 16 tops. But um, you would go uh, like uh, two tops, four tops, eight tops, uh, 16, 32, 64. Um, there was one person who commented on my uh, channel saying that they did one uh, 100 and, uh, 120 some tops, 128 tops. So uh, wow. I wanted him to send me pictures, but uh, he didn't reply back to me after I replied to him. So I was interested in seeing that. Uh, it would have been quite wild. So uh, picking that up, I might actually do that this spring on an outdoor plant. I might do one with a ridiculous amount of tops. But uh, sorry for the sh short version of how you mainline. It's basically what you do is you continue to top until you get as many tops as you want. And then... Uh, Anyway, when you mainline, uh, like I said before, all of your bud focuses to the top and to colas instead of uh, a bunch of branches everywhere. Yeah, because you're still kind of doing that lollipop technique where you're taking off the lower third or lower fourth, some people do, and then that helps focus it on top. I, th I think mainlining, the theory behind it is that, and I don't think anybody can prove this, is that if you have equal distance from the stock to the colas, then it's evenly transporting nutrients up to the branches, right? So like, if you look at the main line, how it's actually done, all the branches are, are even, right? They're, they're the same exact distance to where your colors start, right? I did a little bit of a variation of main lining. Basically what I did was I let it grow to the fifth node, top down to the third node, left the second node branching, and removed, I think I removed the first node branching. So basically right off the bat, I was able to have four branches right off the bat. You know, they're not evenly branched. The branches aren't evenly distributed or whatever you want to call it. Like, But I, I found like it was a little bit of a shortcut to the mainlining process. And then I did do a top. So it's eight, eight tops, eight main colas, 16 main colas, topped again, 32 main colas. So 32 was the most I ever done. I personally felt like it was a little bit of overkill for my situation because I was trying to keep the plant in a two foot by two foot space. So having 32 tops on a plant, I think I was in a three gallon container too. I felt like, you know, I didn't get much of a stretch once flipping over the flowers. So the plant was small and, you know, because when you top and you have all these different branches, when you do that flip to flower and it starts that stretching period, well, you don't just have a few branches stretch. You have more branches stretching. So you're not really going to get as much of a stretch most of the time, right? Generally speaking. But yeah, eight main tops is typically what I go for. Sometimes 16 main tops for me, kind of growing each plant in a two foot by two foot space. So that's what I found works well for me. But I feel like there are so many different ways to kind of go about it. And I always tell people to experiment, right? Try things out, see what you can do, have fun with it. So Yeah, that's the thing with it, right? Like uh, mainlining, it uh, puts you, uh, you're so much hands on. And I really like, uh, I really enjoy training plants and uh, growing the plants. It's not just all about yield or how fast I could turn over a grow. It's like I enjoy the training and doing what I do. It's like I don't want to rush it and get it all knocked out in a, a couple weeks. Like uh, I will get a lot of people will comment and be like, oh, that takes way too long. It's like in all reality, it, uh, mainlining only adds a week on to what I regular veg anyway. So, like, I regularly veg about five weeks. Uh, I'll go six weeks with the main line, right? Like, it doesn't add all that much more time, but uh, it's what I enjoy to do. If I wanted to just knock them out of the park, I would just fill the tent with uh, six plants uh, every time I grew and do no training and just grow them fast, right? So, uh, yeah, being hands-on with your plants is one of the most uh, fun ways to do it, I find. So, that's what I'll continue to do. Absolutely. Yeah. I've seen you had some amazing success with the scrog technique. Can you explain your process there? Yeah, I got, uh, I've got. i done a couple scrogs. I think this is one of the first ones I've ever actually done on my channel. But uh, for the most part, I would have enjoyed to start off with like two plants, but I didn't know uh, until later on that I was going to be doing a scrog. So I did it with four plants. Kind of happy I did that anyway because it filled the canopy a little bit more. But I went from seed, so it was up in the air of, like, what kind of phenos I was going to get. So I was a little worried about that. But uh, I ended up making it work. Uh, what I'll do is, for hybrid strains, I will just keep tucking my branches under. 
Uh, I don't usually weave my branches through because it's a bitch to harvest. Oh, sorry about my language there. But, it's uh, all good. <laughs> pain in a butt to uh, harvest that. So what I'll do is I'll just tuck all the branches right underneath, and they're all pushing up on the scrog. So then uh, they gain their support that way. So uh, then you just end up with a bunch of tops, and uh, you'll be good to go. I'm in week five now, so if there's anyone interested in seeing how a uh, good scrog goes, uh, feel free to go check out my channel because uh, I'm just in week five now. We still have a few weeks of that left to go. Uh, for most viewers, it's the most exciting part because we're starting to put on all the bud. So uh, that's uh, it's Biddies by Soulfire Gardens, uh, and it's a real nice strain with a real potent smell to it. I'm really excited about. So a follow-up question I have for you is like, some people swear that you should do one top first, and then it allows the lower branches to come out and then spread into that scrub net a little bit easier. And then also, some people swear by a certain height from the grow pot, the net should be a certain height above that. Do you do a topping, and then what is your distance from grow pot to net? Yeah, uh, you're right there. Uh, I like to leave a distance about a foot. Uh, so I'll get my plants to grow about a foot, and then I'll toss toss them underneath the scrog, or I'll put the scrog down, and then I'll start to train from there. Uh, it really doesn't look like you're getting much out of it the first couple of weeks. It just looks like a uh, plant bent over, but uh, it seems to be one of my uh, a better way to do it. And uh, so I'm just trying to remember the second part to your question. Oh uh, no, I don't top. So uh, no, I don't. Uh, uh, I didn't top this time anyway. Uh, next time, maybe I will. I switch it up here and there, but uh, for the most part, no. I just bent it over, let all those branches come up, and then uh, continue to bend them over and underneath uh, the scrog. Okay. And then when I actually went to your, I saw this on your Instagram, is that you're using not your traditional scrog net. It looks like it's like a clear plastic, and they're not actually squares. Can you talk to us about what you're using there? Yeah, I found that online, so... Uh... Usually when I use like scrog netting, I can't even say usually because I don't do it all that often really to tell you the truth. I've done it a few times now, but uh, usually I want like uh, smaller squares. I find it's easier to train with like smaller squares, like three inch squares. Uh, so what I was doing is I was looking for something that I could hook up to my uh, Gorilla Grow Tent, uh, the high CFM kit. Uh, I don't know if you know those bars that go across in your uh, uh, tent. It helps for the suction of the sides. Anyway, I was looking for uh, I was looking for a scrog to attach to that, and I came across that other scrog online. Uh, uh, it's called a P scrog. I forget the name of the website, but uh, that's what I'm using there now, and uh, that's the plastic one. I'm real happy with that. It came with like uh, the poles, and uh, it was easy to put together, reusable, washable, and uh, I don't have to worry about uh, trying to untangle uh, a messy net. Gotcha. And then are you just doing one net or some people do like two layers, some people do three layers? Yeah, so that's what I, I do, right? Like uh, I just do the one layer because what I'll do is I will, uh, I'll tuck until up to uh, the first week of flower is over. So that that's enough stability when those all those tops come up and put your buds there. You're going to get nice size colas. They're going to end up far away from away from your light uh i don't know i just find it ends up perfect if you do your tucking until the end of week one now that could change obviously if you're going with like a more sativa strain i would probably tuck until like uh, maybe the end of week two uh really i would just watch that plant and see how it starts out stretching since i flip it from 12 12 and uh, i would just judge it from there but for the most part for like your indicas and your hybrids uh I suggest training them, keep tucking them until your first week of flower is over. And then uh, you won't need that second screen to support your buds. Okay, that's good to know. How about defoliation? You know, a lot of people group this in to plant training. Some people call it pruning method, right? Do you do any sort of defoliation? If so, what's your process for that? So yeah, if I'm uh, if I'm just growing my plants uh, normally, say so giving them one topping or whatever, I will do uh, I'll do, do a good defold maybe around uh, week four and a half, five of uh, veg, just to keep all the airflow going, make sure that all the bud sites and uh, uh, branches are going to get light to them, mostly for airflow. I'm all about the airflow. Um, and then uh, yeah, so uh, later on in flower, about week three. 
I will do another heavy default depending on how I grew them. Uh, with the main lines, you don't really need a default all that much because you're defaulting as you go. But uh, but yeah, when I do a default, I sometimes I'll strip them right down uh, depending on like the cultivar, or I'll. Uh, I'll be a little more easier on it and just select which ones I want. Uh, with autos, I will tuck most of the time and just do selective defoliation. Uh, I don't like to go real crazy with autos. I learned my lesson with them a couple times from going too hard on them. So uh, for the most part, I'll just tuck and uh, remove the ones that absolutely need to be moved. Uh, then, sorry, for, uh, then for in flower on photo periods like I said I'll do a strip in like week three but continuing out in flower all I'll do then is I'll just uh, again I'll select uh, certain leaves that are blocking bud sites that I'll remove the rest of the way through flower and now you mentioned super cropping you do that sometimes when did you say that you typically do it uh, well I, I don't do it all that often but I will do it like if I get a, a branch getting out of hand getting taller than the other ones then I'll super crop it just to bring it down and have it with uh, flatten out the canopy or on my outdoor grows uh, when I'm starting out outdoors sometimes I'll just give it a hardcore super crop break that thing right in half we'll bend it right in half uh, so that all the other bottom branches come up to uh, start filling uh, start filling like the fencing that I put around my plants uh, outdoors so uh, sometimes I do it sometimes I won't uh, again it just depends yeah I think the only time I really do super cropping is when you know I've flipped the plants to flowering and I'm having trouble controlling the stretch right because some of these phenos they're just going to stretch <laughs> way beyond your expectation right I had a, a pheno frozen fuel by Square One Genetics, shout out THC Titan. It stretched three times the amount wow. it was in vegetation stage. So I was like blown away. <laughs> I almost ran out of height. And yeah, that in particular, if I was running out of height or, you know, maybe I'm doing the scrub technique or whatever, and some branches are higher than others, that's when I'll do the super cropping technique for the most part. I know Pigeons, he does super cropping. He swears by this every single one of his branches and when they're small and he swears by it uh, and he has a lot of success doing that so it's something that i haven't tried yet but i've been wanting to try i think maybe this round next time around i'm gonna have to try to super drop every every branch and see if it can build up some strength see if it actually does work or not yeah i find or if uh with your branches if you like mess around with them right make them feel like they're out in nature uh, bend them around and stuff just to strengthen them up i find that beefs them up a bit that and some good silica but uh, I've, I've never super cropped every single branch, no. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a unique technique, that's for sure. Yeah, he's always had a pretty unique way of growing. Like, his training's always been pretty heavy uh, ever since, like, I started watching him maybe, like, four years ago. Uh, yeah, he's always, uh, he always did some real heavy training. I know that uh, lost a lot of those videos were lost, I think, when he lost his channel. But, uh, yeah, he used to have a real lot of uh, good training episodes on there. So we covered a lot in this episode. You know, we went over lighting, went over environment, we went over plant training. What advice do you have for new growers? I mean, we went over so much information. There are some folks that are brand new that are just starting that might consider this overwhelming to hear this type of information. Um, a lot of people just want to keep it simple. What advice do you have for people who are just starting out? Have fun with it. Don't let it stress you out at all. Uh, and if you're planning on certain like a YouTube channel, don't stress about that either. Like uh, your subscribers will come. But uh, for the most part, do not stress about growing. It's all going to come with you. Uh, watch a lot of videos. Uh, try to only like do one thing at a time. Uh, don't try to uh, show a master garden or have a master garden. Try to like grow that one plant first see how you can do with that and then upscale i say start with the basics get a, a a good light is always key of course uh then you could need some fans and stuff but just start with the basics uh start with like a basic nutrient line as well and uh just take it easy don't get stressed out don't get mad at yourself and uh you're not growing to impress anyone else it's another thing i try to tell people like i have no one to impress either to you you have no one to impress just grow your herb and have fun doing it well said well right. said for sure so wrapping things up how can listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future i uh 
well, I have my YouTube channel, Rose of Green. That's my main one. Then I have a backup channel. Uh, it's more or less of a... It's called Rog Grotech. Uh, it's where I show off, like, lights and uh, fans. I just do reviews of products on there. And then, uh, of course, I have my Instagram, uh, Rose of Green 420. And uh, something new that I'm doing is uh, I've been dabbling in the breeding for the last couple of years. And uh, I'm going to be releasing a strain here shortly in the next... Uh, month or so uh, it's called rewind it's a cross of uh granddaddy purple and og kush breath so uh you can check that out uh go to just follow my channel along and i'll show you where you can find them because i can't really spit it out on here without uh youtube getting angry <laughs> <laughs> that cultivar you mentioned is it a f1 f2 three yeah what is it it's, uh, i bred it to an f2 I, okay. uh, I, I, uh, I found a really nice granddaddy purple a couple of years ago, so I've used that in a couple of good crosses. Uh, and then I found a real nice OG Kush breath, so I made the cross there. And then, uh, again, I found a couple nice sister and brother, so I turned it into an F2. And then I just made uh, the feminized version of it. I made some S1, so I'm going to be releasing the regular seeds and the feminized seeds together. Awesome. Good yeah. stuff there. Well, I will definitely have a link to Rose of Green channel down in the description section below if you're watching on YouTube. Of course, if you're on one of the podcast platforms, just search his name, Rose of Green. It'll pop up first thing right off the bat. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. I release these Garden Talk episodes every single week. And if you're on one of the podcast platforms, particularly Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. We're coming up. I think we're so close to getting 200 ratings and reviews. So... If you're on Apple Podcasts, please take a minute. Let's reach that goal of 200. I would greatly appreciate it. Well, it's, this was awesome. This was really, really fun talk. We covered a lot. Thank you for your time today. This is this is cool. Hey, man. Uh, I appreciate you asking me to come on. This is uh, my first, uh, first interview or uh, working with any other uh, influencer. So it's kind of cool to uh, even come on in the first place. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah, no problem. Well, I will leave it at that, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Peace yep. out, everyone.